Hello, I'm Cheryl McCarthy of the City University of New York. Welcome to One to One. There seem to be quite a few shows on television these days about former members of the Amish religious group who are trying to build new lives for themselves in a more modern world, and about women who once belonged to authoritarian, polygamous religious groups, but have broken away in order to claim greater freedom and create new identities for themselves. Deborah Feldman has also come a long way after growing up in the Satmar community in Williamsburg, Brooklyn. It's a community of Hasidic Jews where the lives of both men and women, but especially women, are severely constricted. The author of Unorthodox, which was about her break from that community, she has now written about her journey since then and about her transformation as she sought to discover her roots and develop a new light. Her latest book, Exodus, has just been published by the Blue Rider Press imprint of Penguin Books. Welcome. Thank you so much for having me. So, for those who, of us who haven't read your first book uh, on Orthodox, well, we'll get a little background. You grew up in the Satmar community in Williamsburg. The Satmars are a branch of uh, Hasidic Jews. Um, what was it like growing up in that community? Well, I can tell you this for starters. I cannot remember a moment when I wasn't aware of my identity as a descendant of Holocaust survivors because the Satmar community in Williamsburg was founded by survivors and it centered around the ideology that the Holocaust was a punishment for Zionism and assimilation and that going back to the most extreme ghetto life was the only way to avoid another one from happening again, the only way for us to be spared God's wrath again. And that mark on my consciousness is probably the one thing that I have not fully escaped, even though I have escaped the more apparent restrictions, such as having to shave my head and cover it with a wig or having to wear clothing that covers my knees and my elbows and my collarbone and, you know, having to be a stay-at-home mom who raises a family of maybe a dozen children um, without ever having a hope of pursuing an education or a career or any life outside of that, you know. Very limited education for everybody, ma male and female? Yes, extremely limited education for males, actually. The, the males barely learn any kind of secular education. They are obliged to study the Torah, the Bible, and the oral Torah, which is the sort of the oral tradition around the Bible that the rabbis of yore built and, and uh, transcribed. Whereas women are not allowed to study the Torah. The Torah is a men-only um, text. So women learn the laws of Judaism that apply to their arenas, so laws of kosher because they prepare the food, and um, the laws of nida, which is the laws surrounding purity in marriage. Um, because women's sexuality is very strictly controlled in the community. So when you get married, you're considered unclean for the week that you're menstruating and the week after, and you're required to go to a ritual bath and purify yourself, and then you, know, you are free to procreate. Um, these are laws that are seen as necessary for women to learn. And then in addition to that, women get rudimentary basics of secular education as mandated by the government, but it falls, I think, far short of the mandate in reality um, I remember as a child, um, the, the, the school would call a group of very intelligent students from the bunch and have us take government-mandated tests to show that we were on level because we were able to score higher than um, the rest of the student body. So I was actually one of those students called, I remember when I was 13 and again when I was 15, to take a test um, so that we could show the government that I, um, you know, that I was up to par. Um, and we got some basic, basics in math, we got some basics in science, um, but by the time I left high school in the community, I remember that the women around me were stumbling through the basic literary text that we were given to practice reading to the point where now I would expect that kind of stumbling, and, you know, my son is in second grade, mm -hmm. I don't even see him stumbling the really? way the women in my classroom stumbled, and I didn't realize this until I I saw him go through his own schooling. It's absolutely incredible to watch my son um, excel academically. He's, he's seven years old, he's going on eight, and he's reading voraciously. He's reading so quickly and so clearly. And 
it's amazing. It really puts everything that I went through in perspective because I thought it was bad, but I didn't think it was that bad. Right, right. But it's, it's that bad. Now, your mother had left your father at some point. How old were you? You know, um, my mom, we're, we're actually pretty close these days, but I didn't have much contact with her growing up. My mom had such a difficult life, you know, more so even than mine because she was also the product of a divorce. So she grew up in a Hasidic community in England, and her parents divorced um, when she was young, um, although her mother managed to have four children before that, um, because he had some mental illnesses himself that he suffered from, and they couldn't make it work. And at that time, you know, which was, this would be in like the 60s, 70s, divorce was way more of a scandal than it was when I was growing up. And so my mother was also marked as an outcast in her community when she was young. And she grew up in a poor family, and she really had nothing to go for her in that society. And so when she was um, a teenager, she was purchased, essentially, because my father's family had money, and they couldn't find anyone local to marry him because he had severe disabilities. And um, everyone in the community knew that, and they didn't want to marry their children off to him, understandably. But my grandparents were desperate to marry him off because he had siblings behind him who were waiting to get married as well, and they're all very close in age. And we don't skip. You know, we go in chronological order when it comes to arranged marriages. And so if they couldn't arrange his marriage, everybody else would be delayed. And once you hit a certain age in that community, you're just no longer fresh meat. Um, so they decided to purchase a bride. They found my mother, who was poor and, and, and was the product of scandal herself, and they said to her, we have money and we will give you an apartment in America and every one of your needs will be taken care of and you know here's your chance for a wonderful future and she didn't really have any other options. And she came from what country? From from England. Okay. And um, so she came to the States and I think soon after she married I think she started to realize the truth about my father and my mother is an incredibly intelligent woman and it, I think it was a particularly a particularly cruel to arrange her marriage to a man who was so severely mentally hindered. And I think she felt extremely lonely and isolated when she came here because although my family was really relieved to have their brother, their problem brother married off, they then resented her because she was the spouse of this brother that they were ashamed of and they treated her awfully. They were very cruel to her and eventually she felt like she had really nothing to lose if she were to leave. And I think she started by getting a college education. You know, this was when I was very young, so I didn't remember it, and I really wasn't aware of what was going on. But she was gone a lot uh, when I was young. And so my care already had fallen to my grandparents and my aunts and uncles. And, um, and then at some point, there were, you know, the, the usual you know, process of divorce, lots of fighting, lots of screaming. Um, I was kind of taken away from that environment because it, you know, I was a child and they didn't want me to be exposed to it. So I wasn't around for that either and I found out all that later. But she left, but they didn't give her a divorce. And she was so concerned about being deported because she didn't have full citizenship that she couldn't really come after me because right. the community had so much power in terms of like financially, they could hire the best lawyers, right. she didn't have any money. So you stayed with and were raised by your grandparents? Eventually, I was handed off permanently to my grandparents okay. by my extended family. What was your relationship? Your, your grandmother obviously had a big impact on you. What was your relationship with her like? Incredible. My grandmother was the only person in the world I grew up in who really loved me for who I was, unconditionally, no judgments. Even though I broke the rules and I was considered different and I reminded everyone of the scandal of my parents, she never resented me for it even as everyone around me did. And she was a tremendous inspiration to me because the Satmar world is so stark and so ascetic. It's so joyless in many ways. And everybody around me was living these very deprived lives on purpose because they had Holocaust guilt. And even though she was the lone survivor of her entire extended family, she wasn't like that. She sang, you know, in a community where music was forbidden most mm -hmm. of the time. And she grew a garden, the only garden in Williamsburg, and she baked beautiful desserts. So it was a very loving relationship with her grandmother. It was. It wasn't very talkative. We didn't talk about the serious things, but there was this unspoken communication between us. I, I think I'm the person I am because of her. Okay. Now, but you were put into an arranged marriage when you were 17, correct? Yes. Um, and it was not a happy marriage? No. 
unfortunately not. And um, you decided at, you had a son, was it about, how, about a year into your marriage, how long, okay. A year into my marriage I got pregnant. Okay, okay. And what was it that made you decide to, to leave? Having him, to be honest, not because I didn't want to leave before that, but it's very scary and um, I wasn't sure I was willing to take the risk. I really thought I was doomed to failure. However, when he was born, my son, it didn't matter so much whether or not I failed. What mattered to me was that I did the right thing and spared him the life I knew he was doomed to experience. It's hard to explain, but the only emotion I really felt when my son was born was guilt. Now I feel all sorts of emotions. But when he came into my life, all I could think was, I'm responsible for him coming into the world. I'm responsible for everything that he experiences. Everything is going to be my fault. And it's one thing, you know, to endure it yourself, but to foist that life on this innocent human being, it felt, it made me feel like a bad person. Uh, I really don't know how, any other way to put it. And um, so once I was doing everything for him, it just changed. It wasn't about self-interest anymore. It wasn't about my fears or my doubts. It was about how much I could achieve for him. Right. And so, you know, I started small. I started with going to college. I thought that a degree would be the first step. Were you able to do that in that community to go, you know, go to college? Or did you above have to leave board? first? No, I wasn't allowed to go to college, but I figured out a way to keep it secret for a while. Okay, well, intriguing. We'll, we'll continue with that when we come back from a short break. Then we'll be back with more with Deborah Feldman, author of Exodus, after the following messages. <music> Welcome back to One to One. I'm Cheryl McCarthy of the City University of New York, and I'm talking with Deborah Feldman, author of Exodus, which was published by the Blue Rider Press imprint of Penguin Books. So we're talking about how you engineered your, I'll say, escape, if you will, from, from uh, Brooklyn. So you started college even while you were within that community? How did you manage that? Well, at that point in my life, I had convinced uh, my husband at the time to move to a more liberal version of a Hasidic community in upstate New York, where there was a greater diversity of Jewish people and not everybody was ultra-religious and there was more space, you know, everyone was kind of spread out, your neighbors weren't watching you so closely. And so I was able to just say, I'm going to the mall to go shopping because I had learned how to drive, even though that was against the rules, and instead go to college and no one would be the wiser as long as I come, came home with shopping bags, right? There's always ways to um, disguise my activities. And where were you going to where were you going to college? I was going to Sarah Lawrence. It was okay. twenty minutes away from where I lived. And how did you pay for that? Well, I when I you know, obviously when I first applied to Sarah Lawrence, I made it very clear that I couldn't afford it. It's it was I believe it still is the most expensive college in the United States. Um, mm, I don't know, Bennington maybe, but <laughs> <laughs> I think they're both up there. Okay. <laughs> Top five for sure. Um, they had a very small endowment and they couldn't really afford to give many scholarships, but they did offer me one at the time when I applied. And then in 2008, we had the crash and they lost two thirds of their endowment. And then I lost my scholarship as well. And so the last, last two years were quite a struggle. Um, but in the beginning, it was amazing. Everything was paid for and I was exposed to a whole new world, a world that everyone had told me was awful, was dangerous, would corrupt me, you know, would, would hurt me. And instead, it was the opposite was happening. Uh, I felt validated. I found others who were like me. I felt connected. I felt um, accepted for the first time in my life. It was an amazing environment for me. And when did your husband, you were able to keep this a secret from him? Until? For a while. Okay. Um, eventually he found out that was near to the end of our marriage and um, we fought about it. But like many situations in our marriage, if I did want something, there really wasn't a way for him to stop me. And because he knew I, I felt like I had nothing to lose. Like, um, I knew I wanted out. I really did. I just didn't know how that would happen. And, and how did you engineer the final break? The final break actually was one of those very strange things. I, I didn't control it. Um, 
I got into a really bad car accident. And it's almost a cliche. When you feel like you come so close to losing your life, you see everything differently. You realize that um, you know if you don't do something now, you might never. And time is a marching. And I thought, I can't. I can't waste another day. Like I felt like I'd gotten a new lease. And it was just literally, I, I came out of the hospital, and I rented a car, and I left. Like I just split and second. Where did you go? You and Isaac, where did you go? Well, at first, I stayed with some friends I'd met in college um, while we figured out our situation. You know, We had a lot to figure out legally. I had to consult lawyers. I had to figure out like how I would establish custody of my own son because it had never been really done before. Women had often lost custody of their children when they had left the community and I was determined for that not to happen because everything I'd done was for my son. So that required some really careful legal planning and a lot of assistance from professors at Sarah Lawrence, from various um, law schools that I went to to consult with. I consulted with the Dean of Columbia Law School and eventually I found, I found a, a lawyer who was um, on the Women's Bar Association. Um, but that took time and you know, meanwhile I was staying with friends and they were supporting me and helping me um, start my life and eventually I found my own place and you know, worked my way up from there. And how were, what kind of, how were you supporting yourself? After well, you left? I was really it was amazingly lucky because while I was at Sarah Lawrence I was doing a lot of writing and I ended up writing this anonymous blog about my life. And a literary agent found that and asked if I would like to sell a book. And she worked with me um, soon after I left to do that. She put together a proposal with me and we sold my first book, Unorthodox to Simon & Schuster, um, to David Rosenthal, actually, who's my publisher now at, at Penguin. It's amazing. Well, yeah. Uh, and that's, it's and that's what sustained you. That's, that's the most of what sustained me okay. most of the time. Okay. Now, a lot of you know, uh, what you're writing about in Exodus is about um, tra traveling and trying to uncover your grandmother's past. But you reestablished a relationship with your mother after you left? I did, yes. Where um, was she? Where was she? So she was living in Brooklyn, and she has been a, a teacher in public high school for almost the last decade. And um, she teaches the sciences, and she's really, really smart. It's funny, um, she and my son really bond about that, because okay. they always talk about science. But um, so she and I are like reconnecting, and it's been really interesting having conversations with her about her past, which is difficult for her, and kind of comparing our stories, realizing that we're more similar than we both realized. But what I think um, is interesting is that I feel like my mother and I still have a very long way to go in terms of our relationship. I feel like I'm going to learn much more about her in the next 10 years as my son grows up. Whereas I feel like I've learned so much about my grandmother in the past five years just by reflecting and processing our relationship. I really feel like I see our relationship in a way that I never did before. Now are you totally disconnected from people in the Satmar community yes. in Williamsburg? total break there. Yeah. Um, so you started traveling um, to all around the world really to reconstruct your, to learn about your grandmother's past. You went to Hungary, Sweden, France. Hungary where your grandmother was grew born. up. Sweden and actually she, her whole family was wiped out in the Holocaust and she after miraculously escaping from Auschwitz and Bergen-Belsen uh, wound up in Sweden where she recuperated uh, after the war. And I think, did she also go to France at some point? No, oh, you went to France I did. as part I of I was your all over. I think I, I had a lot of wanderlust, but I think the reason for the wanderlust was that I felt so incredibly alienated after I left, and that sometimes when I traveled and I was a foreigner, I felt more comfortable than when I was supposedly at home because mm -hmm. I really, it resonated with me. The alienated from what? From society. In general because I had left the only world that was familiar to me and I didn't feel comfortable with any of the new stuff and I didn't belong anywhere right. and I didn't have family I didn't have people who knew me from way back when I felt like I wasn't on the grid which is how I explain it in my book like something's wrong I don't really exist and traveling was both a way of finding out who I really was and where I did belong but also a way of kind of putting a bomb on that wound that was so fresh so what did you learn um, from going to the historical places where your grandmother had been? This, I learned the story of her life, which she had never wanted to talk about with me because it was too difficult for her. I learned that she had actually not grown up Hasidic. She had not grown up in an extremist environment. She grew up very modern Orthodox, um, more traditional, so to speak. And so it was really interesting to me to figure out how she had ended up Hasidic. And then I, you know, I discovered that after being deported to Auschwitz, she was um, selected for skilled labor 
out of everyone in her family because she wasn't holding a child. So she actually met Dr. Mengele and was the only one in her family selected for labor. She was then transferred to work in several armaments factories in Germany where she manufactured guns and grenades and weapons for the Nazi army. I mean, there's, there's actually a memorial to her and the, and the Hungarian women she worked with in a small town in northern Germany because of that, because I think it's a particularly cruel to force her to make the agents of her destruction, in a sense. And then when they were, um, when the war was coming to an end, the Germans dumped her at Bergen-Belsen um, and pretty much left. And at that point, she had contracted typhus. And by the time the British liberated Bergen-Belsen, she was almost mistaken for a corpse. And I still have the photo of her being carried out by the Red Cross, and it's in my first book. Um, she was very lucky because Sweden was taking in uh, typhus sufferers. They were, um, they had a program where they were, all the typhus um, sufferers were being sent there, and you know she was able to stay in these beautiful resorts. She was very well taken care of, and she w was quickly able to find ways to support herself once she recovered. And she spent three years trying to get a visa to anywhere. She expressed interest in going to Palestine which is particularly ironic considering she ended up in an anti-Zionist sect. Um, she even uh, signed a petition to enter Cuba where she was, where she would only have been granted um, an agricultural visa. She would mm -hmm. only be able to work on farms. So she was really desperate to start over and no one would take her. Hungary wouldn't even acknowledge her citizenship. And so by some, you know, twist of fate and like a lot of effort, she ended up in the States. Now, are you, is your grandmother still alive? She is in hospice now. Okay, okay. And she has been suffering from dementia for the past, I would say, four or five years. So she actually doesn't even know anything about this trip, which is so hard for me to know. And I'm dying to see her. I, it hurts me so much that I can't. But my family won't let me. Not because they don't, they think she doesn't want to see me, it's because they want to hurt me. And that's something that has been pressing on my mind for the past few months. Mm -hmm. We only have, you know, unfortunately we, ha we, we only have two more minutes left, but you, you wrote that what you inherited from your grandmother and learning about her life was the knowledge that home is an internal space that you can carry with you. You don't have to have family to survive, only your convictions. But home is something you can carry with you. That's, yeah, that's definitely something I've learned over the past few years and that I finally feel it in my bones. I now feel that wherever my son and I may end up, that our home is in our hearts, our home is each other. And I do little things to remind me of my ties to my past. I plant flowers because my grandmother planted them. I make the food that she makes. I sing the songs she th sings. I know where I come from. And I'm connected so much deeper than the Satmar community I was raised in. I'm connected to her family and her experiences growing up. And I'm connected to her grandparents' experience. I go way back. I go deeper than Satmar. And that's what I've learned. You describe yourself as a global Jew. Exactly. Right. Yes. Are you an, an observant Jew? And do you raise your son as in the Jewish faith? I like certain traditions, but I wouldn't consider myself observant. I would consider myself very spiritual, and I feel that my Jewish identity is stronger than it ever was when I was growing up, which is interesting. Um, and eventually, at the end of the book, um, it becomes clear to me that even as I'm trying to catapult myself outside of the boundaries of Jewishness, in the end, I have a new unique kind of Jewishness and it trumps every boundary that was ever enforced on me and I'm cool with that now okay fascinating and happier now a lot yeah. happier yeah so and and having I, ha I must say that having read your second book now I'm going to go back and read your first book because I find the the story very fascinating thank you we're out of time but I want to thank Deborah Feldman for joining us today Exodus has just been published by the Blue Rider Press an imprint of Penguin Books. For the City University of New York and One to One, I'm Cheryl McCarthy. If there are any people you'd like to hear from or topics you'd like us to explore, please let us know. 
You can write to me at CUNY TV, 365 Fifth Avenue, New York, New York, 10016, or you can go to the website at cuny.tv and click on Contact Us. I look forward to hearing from you.